good evening and welcome to episode 26 of Fracking Nightmare. One of the things that uh, disturbs me a little is that according to YouTube, then the show is still only watched by something like about 2,000 viewers. Now, we know we have uh, quite a few hundred online live, which aren't added into the YouTube numbers. And we also know that anywhere where somebody watches it embedded into another website like Facebook, that also doesn't count towards the YouTube numbers. But this is really startling because if the YouTube numbers are correct, then over the last few weeks, I have pretty much met, it would seem, everyone who watches this program, which I very much doubt. So could it be that YouTube are actually manipulating the numbers? And if that was the case, on whose instruction might they be manipulating those numbers? The British government has effectively acknowledged that the anti-fracking community is an irritant. We are indeed making headway, and a recent poll has shown that the number of people who are against fracking is now well and truly above 50%. But as we'll see as we go through the program, the next 340 odd days are going to be absolutely crucial. Because if we are not able to shut this abomination down prior to the next UK election on May the 7th of 2015, then the likelihood is that whomever enters number 10 to take the office of prime minister will claim that they have been elected with a fracking agenda as part of their manifesto. So we have a very tight time scale. Now, a number of people have um, contacted me over the past uh, 15 months or so, well, 18 months now, that I've been on the front line of this campaign and suggested that I am exaggerating my claims of the contamination and more significantly of the negative health impacts associated with this industry. Well, a former colleague of mine, a lady whom I worked very closely with in the immediate aftermath of the BP Deepwater Horizon disaster, a US um, um, activist, journalist by the name of Deborah Dupre. And Deborah worked with me in exposing the perpetrators behind the Deepwater Horizon disaster. And we focused very much on the company men, and in particular, one of them that was placed on the rig three days before that event, a gentleman by the name of Bob Kaluza. Deborah, being based in the US, took a lot more flack than I did being this side of the Atlantic. But Deborah never once let up and maintained her focus in trying to bring the perpetrators of that disaster to justice. It's in a big part to Deborah's tenacity that Bob Kaluza and his counterpart, Donald Vadreen, were indicted on 11 counts of involuntary manslaughter in December of 2012. Now, Deborah Dupre has turned her attention to exposing the dangers associated with the hydraulic fracturing industry in the US. And I want to open this evening's show by showing a short video that Deborah has put together where she has looked at, and not exclusively to, um, the, as she calls it the Fractor Faulkner cover up because it's based in Faulkner County. And she talks about house explosions, suicides, miscarriages, and baby deaths, infant mortality, and spontaneous abortion, which she and many in the community believe to be a direct result of the hydraulic fracturing industry within proximity of their communities. So take a look at this video and I will see you in about 15 minutes. This is Deborah Dupre. I'm reporting from Arkansas. I'm discussing some of the problems that the people here in Conway and other parts of Arkansas nearby have experienced. Hello, my name is April Lane. I'm a member of the Faulkner County Citizens Advisory Group. I'm also president of Environmental Alliance and uh, co-director of ArkansasFracking.org. 
I've, over the last two and a half years, visited with residents and families throughout the Fayetteville Shale, many of who have had disastrous negative effects to them. One of whom is Beverly Lankford, who lives in Bee Branch, Arkansas, a good friend of a childhood friend of mine. It's her mother, actually. And when drilling occurred in her area, began having uh, night spells, couldn't sleep. Uh, had to begin taking medication as well as her daughter and everyone else in the home to be able to sleep at night. Uh, she ended up getting fibromyalgia um, and having s nervous spasms through her body, um, lots of respiratory effects. And she reached out to every state agency uh, and legislator that she could think of um, to no avail. Uh, no one came to help until after the drilling had ceased and left the area after which you did come out and test the air and was um, She, to this day, is a strong supporter of us and our group, but has run out of fuel to keep fighting. So that is what we're here to do, is continue that fight for her. I'm Dirk de Turk uh, here in Greenbrier. We're surrounded by 14 miles with two miles. Uh, within a thousand feet, there's six of them. And I've had the rashes, the nose bleeds, my tongue's bled shortly after the fracking process was done on those wells. And There's been a number of house fires of officially inexplainable origin, although they have been close to drilling, compressing, or transporting pipeline. Um, industry, construction, the houses would catch fire very rapidly and without a lot of explanation and then some of them would continue to burn as the point of what we would think uh, a house should as though there was still a fuel source involved. So and that's happened a number of times although it's not being reported or tracked as such. Right here across the little ravine back in the woods double wide modular home just burned to the ground uh, and when it was burning I came down here and it definitely had a fuel source coming out of it there was a pipe sticking up in the air that was like had gas coming out of it and it wasn't a propane tank it was blue blue copper pipe and typically here in Arkansas that blue copper pipe is buried in the slab that's water uh, and this would be on a watered well on this road. I suspect that was the house filled with methane through the water and something torched it electrically, a spark of some kind. Some four houses that have mysteriously exploded and burned to the ground. This is the big fear at the Bayou Corn sinkhole. Explosions. Explosions. There's two of them are north of us, this one. And there's one right down here at the bottom of the hill that went about a year before this one did. It also had a fuel source in the middle of the house. It burned for three days. Uh, you never see the industry around, although I have seen up here uh, these, oh, they're labeled emergency drilling response teams. Uh, they have pickup trucks with spilled kits. They have water and airtight enclosed bulldozers on trailers that you would use to like bulldoze in a, a well that burst into flames or something. And then that house also burst into flames back here on the right uh, and had a fuel source. That burned for three days. Okay, the Michelle area is from Tracy Wilson. She um, is at home most of the time, so her exposure is pretty constant and there's a lot of fracking and drilling in her area. Um, she actually has a facility where she houses um, rescue animals, exotic animals, and many of her animals have lost hair, um, had neurological problems that couldn't be explained through any normal feline diseases. She herself has passed out in her home and has had nosebleeds and she actually about a year and a half ago passed out at the top of her stairs in her home and fell down the stairs. She broke her foot really badly and she's still um, recovering from that. She's had to have two surgeries since then. Her parents who live probably 40 or 50 miles outside of the Shell area came to visit 
and when they were there visiting, they all had nosebleeds at the same time. So there are some very uh, um, immediate effects. Yeah, that's probably one of the most info impactful stories in the Fayetteville Shell. I've had uh, squirrels on the porch, lost their tails, lost hair, tumors, died. We've had deer at the feeders that were all skin and bones. Dead Cooper's hawks in the, in the front yard. Uh, the lady down the road had probably a couple hundred goats when we moved here in 2004. In 2008, they drilled a well right behind her house, like 500 feet. Uh, drilled in 08, it was hydrogen sulfide, never went in production. Uh, she had a couple hundred goats till that happened, and every year it dwindled down to more, less and less goats. She had probably 30 goats and a big old white dog for herding them. And uh, I dropped off hydrogen sulfide information with her. She always looked really bad. And then somebody had hit her dog out here, and she committed suicide right here on the off the shoulder of the road with the dog uh, last year in March. And then... Specific individuals make for great stories and examples. I think in general, the point needs to be made about the exposures to the workers and the often reliance on those workers who are less able to understand the dangers or to protect themselves appropriately. Um, these jobs are high paying and they're also high risk, but due to limited availability of other jobs in the area. For example, one of the workers in that compressor station is back there working like this. What kind of protection is that in your shirt? That's no protection. You need actually need a gas mask when you're doing this or working in them pads. That's toxic stuff they're exposed to every day, just like the residents around it. But, you know, to just put your shirt over your nose to work there, that's not it. That's not the answer. Their company got to know that. That's unacceptable to me. Tracy had lost one of her big cats right around Thanksgiving, and the blood testing and all that came back that it was antifreeze. Well, the cat wasn't exposed to antifreeze, but uh, the ingredients in uh, some of the fracking stuff is antifreeze. And the industry even admits it's antifreeze. Her big hat and then the other animals that she still had, the vets recommended that she start treating them with some grain alcohol to help treat them for this antifreeze poisoning. And it seemed to have worked. And then I'm sitting here remembering over the last three years when the man camp was up here with a couple thousand guys in it, that every week I would see a trailer load of alcohol headed north to the man camp. I followed it to the man camp twice. And not only is that illegal to truck that much alcohol as an individual, but they were doing it. And uh, that would explain some of why the workers aren't as sick as the residents if they drink a lot at night or on weekends. If you're using grain alcohol to treat an animal, well, wouldn't that do the same thing for a human? It makes perfect sense as far as the enzyme reactions within the body as far as counteracting some of those high toxic levels. They also require the workers to work extended hours, many over 80, 90 hours a week. And if they're not able to withstand that pace, then they're not able to keep their job. So what's well known as the healthy worker effect takes place here as well because the exposures are so dynamic and each person's individual ability to be able to process toxins are also different. When they reach that point of no return, then they're simply not able to work any longer and they're no longer considered part of that workforce. We know for sure that the emergency room injuries and trauma related to the industry have certainly spiked and that data is available for review. Um, motor vehicle accidents related to the industry have spiked. So even though many of these occupationally related illnesses and injuries 
are not being reported as such. They certainly are present in the community. The bad air and chemicals in you, I know, is in the livestock here. And livestock are poisoned, and then you eat it. As a human, uh, it's a hundred times stronger chemical in you. If that livestock, whatever it might be, is poisoned and has a baby and is breastfeeding, it's a thousand times stronger than the breast milk. Therefore, that explains why young cows a month or two old die, or there's miscarriages. And I've heard that from humans. I've tried to get these girls to go public with it. I know there's been miscarriages here that live with gas wells like right across the street. There's been a mother that had a miscarriage and a year later had a baby and while she was breastfeeding it, two months old, it died. And then another miscarriage in that same family that lives around these wells. So it's pretty obvious that something's wrong. These are young, healthy girls that are just having miscarriages and losing babies. And I've heard that from several people through friend of a friend had a baby die, two months old or three months old. And it's related to the air. I'm sure it is. There's something in the air that's doing this. It just doesn't happen. But they think it's God's way. I hear that over and over again here. We're in the Bible Belt and they think, God intended that to happen. It can't be the gas wall across the street. It's God's way. And I don't accept that. If, there, if there's something wrong, you got to do something about it. And the seismic activity has certainly been tremendous here in Arkansas. Over 1,400 earthquakes in eight months from the injection wells that they ended up closing. Have the strength and just the wherewithal to to move forward with this and keep going is because of my son Lincoln, uh, who is now three. I remember being in bed with him when we had the 4.7 earthquake before knowing for sure that the injection wells had caused had caused the earthquakes in our area, and uh, it shook the house so hard that. Uh, I heard Sam yell at me from the living room to get Lincoln and I grabbed him and rolled out of bed and ran towards the door. Uh, and just that feeling, that feeling of helplessness and that feeling of not being able to protect him possibly uh, has really stayed with me throughout this whole process, um, especially after finding out that it was the injection walls and it is the fracking uh, and the natural gas extraction that did cause the earthquakes. Uh, I'll never get over that. I will never you know, feel, be able to feel safe and be able to, to, you know, look to my government and local industries and feel like they're doing the best they can because they're not. And it's five, six, seven, open up the pearly gates. Well, there ain't no time to wonder why we all gonna die. Now, come on, Wall Street, don't be slow. I man, this is war a go go. There's plenty of good money to be made. Supplying the army with the tools of the trade. Just don't be afraid if they drop the bomb, they drop it on a Vietnam. Disturbing film, and tragically, that is the situation that is pretty much repeated wherever you go around the USA, where the mother frackers have established their 750,000 wells throughout the United States of America into unconventional geology over the last 20 odd years. If we look at the, uh, the slide here, these are the shale plays in the United States. In the United States, it's estimated that some 15 million people live within one mile of a fracked well. Obviously, the closer one lives to a well, then 
potentially the greater the risk to health. Those of you who have watched episodes two and episodes 18 of Fracking Nightmare will have witnessed the two interviews that I did with Brian Monk, the farmer in southern Queensland who has had his life and livelihood decimated. And in both of those interviews, he actually breaks down as he discusses the impact on the health of his young grandson, who, in his opinion, up until he was at the age of two, was a normally developing two-year-old. But then he started to develop serious health impact, and it has become epileptic. The gas industry, of course, denies that it has anything to do with this, but the increasing evidence from all around the world makes it nigh on impossible for anyone with any common sense to actually continue to deny. Now, in the US, in these shale plays, which um, cover uh, much of the, or the Midwest and, of course, the enormous Marcellus shale play up in the northeast of the country, in southern Queensland, there is an area that is about the size of the UK, and this is the area that has been drilled and fracked with some five and a half thousand wells in just six years. And it is these wells that have devastated large tracts of southern Queensland. In southern Queensland, the population density is one one hundredth of that of the UK. And although I've shown this short animated video before, I want to show it again. We're going to show it during the break. This is an animated video produced by the son of Brian Monk, looking at the location of the gas wells in southern Queensland and just showing how this industry has spread so rapidly. And as David Monk himself says, they were caught asleep at the wheel. Take a look at this. It's an area the size of the UK. If this happens in the UK, a country with a population density 100 times that of this area in southern Queensland, the impact here will be absolutely catastrophic. I'll see you in part two. So where are the gas wells? Number one, Tara Township. Here's the town of Tara. Let's zoom out and find a common radius measurement. So we're looking at about uh, 18 kilometers, so that would put six gas wells within 18 kilometers. So number two, Chinchilla Township. So here's the township of Chinchilla. We zoom out, we get our 18 kilometers again, which gives us about 10 gas wells within the 18 kilometer radius. Now number three, Dolby Township. Okay, so the Dolby Township, let's zoom out, get to our measurement tool, and for Dolby we end up with uh, one gas well within a 19 kilometer radius. Number four, the unlucky ones in the gas fields. This is QGC BG Group's Kenya Gas Fields processing plan on the edge of several residential estates and farms. The evaporation ponds alone cover almost five and a half kilometers. So let's put it in perspective. Let's zoom out from the town of Chinchilla and make a comparison. The entire width from town end to end is uh, 3.21 kilometers. The length is about 3.29 kilometers. The evaporation ponds would cover Chinchilla one and a half times. Let's zoom out from one of QGC's gas fields. Yes, the dots are gas wells. Yes, the industry isn't even exporting yet. Go to our measurement tool and we have around a 22 kilometer radius. Now I'll give you an example of just how safe human beings will be throughout Australia with the unconventional gas industry. QGC's Cape Well Cluster is in the heart of a residential estate. So Toowoomba, unconventional gas has its eyes seriously fixed on you and your surrounds. So no gas wells within a 32 kilometer radius, but if we go for a flight out to your west, you'll see the multinational giants aren't too far away. We pass Mount Irving, Mount Moriah, West Prairie, Cecil Plains, Grassdale, Cumbarilla. Are you enjoying the flight? Bilby, Kogan, Weambilla. I can't see why people are whinging. This should be in everyone's backyard, shouldn't it? Here's QGC's tenements, Origin Energy's tenements. Oh, hang on. 
they're actually multinational corporations. Do you want this where you live? And ending with miles. And how about a flyover from Cecil Plains to central Queensland? This is beautiful farming country. Unfortunately, those that are fixated on containment of the unconventional gas global giants are delusional. Prime agricultural land represents easier, more accessible drilling. It is not protected. As the government has indicated, it does not have the right to take a landholder's right to negotiate with a gas company away from them, even if they are on prime agricultural land. Zooming out and moving further north now, you can see we've really been asleep at the wheel. Zooming in, the blurred clusters turn into definable spots, each one potentially causing irreversible damage to the country. I just cannot stress enough that a majority of the unconventional gas wells are not yet in production. The true effects will become undeniable upon export. What's the scale of damage over Queensland so far? The gas industry is only in first gear in one state, covering over a thousand kilometres long, over 300 kilometres wide. Some very credible projections put total potential unconventional gas well numbers in excess of 200,000 for Queensland alone. It is not the intent of this video to encourage a defeatist thought process. On the contrary, unconventional gas has been heavily wounded in the eyes of the public. Our window of opportunity still exists. Think national, not not in my backyard. Stop the first export train, the Surat Basin to Gladstone's Curtis Island, and stop the unconventional gas industry in this country. Welcome back. That was an animation looking at the some five and a half thousand wells that have been drilled in southern Queensland in the past six or so years. An area the size of the UK, but a population that is less than 1% of that of the UK. Let's have a look at what that looks like in this country. Well, you see on the screen here, this is a picture an image that should be indelibly printed on the brain of everyone who is watching this program. Find this on the web. Use this to talk to your neighbors, your friends, your work colleagues, and show them that the areas in green are the areas designated by the British Geological Society as potentially having viable deposits of unconventional gas, either in shale or in coal bed methane or in the coal seams and the red asterisk on the map um, designate the areas that are licensed for underground coal gasification, fracking's ugly sister. Everything that is in brown on the map is already licensed. That's some 18% of the country. The green is another 46% of the UK. And as of the 1st of July of this year, less than one month away now, everything that is designated in green is effectively up for grabs and will be made available to the highest bidder. I actually hope that every single part of the country that is designated in green there is bought up because when that happens, then there will be some 40 million people who will be potentially affected by this industry that has caused such devastation wherever it has been unleashed around the world. And just to add insult to injury, it has now been leaked that in the Queen's speech, she will make reference to a bill that will effectively remove all legal barriers to fracking under people's properties. So although the landowner will still potentially retain the right to prevent access to the surface of their property, there will be no restriction to the frackers actually drilling horizontally under a property. And in fact, 
if this bill goes through, then the fracking companies will not even have to advise the landowners that they are drilling under the properties. So consequently, although Michael Fallon continuously trots out the fact that this country will have, or does have, the most robust regulatory controls, which it does not. You ask them to define those controls and they will go even deeper into waffle mode. Michael Fallon has also stated that uh, you know, the fracking will not be permitted in any area where the people state that they don't want it. Well, that is an outright lie. And you know, Michael Fallon is fast demonstrating that he has very similar sociopathic tendencies to a certain other individual that was referenced on Humanity versus Insanity earlier tonight. Apparently, Michael Fallon chooses to be totally and completely oblivious to the impact that this industry has had elsewhere in the world. Draw his attention to it, and he will simply, once again, waffle over it. The reality is that every single politician will basically state the same diatribe, that they will oppose hydraulic fracturing in their constituency, but they still support the overall agenda. And as we should see a little bit later, you know, we have a very short time scale in which to really get this shut down. So over the past uh, week or so, I have been on the new front line against the fracking abomination in the UK. So we've moved across the Pennines from Barton Moss into an area, a beautiful area of outstanding natural beauty over in East Yorkshire. The two, um, let's see if I could pull this up here. The two um, areas that are being targeted by Rathlin, Rathlin Energy, a um, Canadian company, are just outside Beverly, which is an extremely beautiful town. I had never been to this town and, until a week ago. It's a stunning town. It's a walled town. It's a wonderful character, but a very conservative area. With the exception of Hull, this whole area is very conservative with a small and with a big C. And the well site outside Beverly is about a mile and a half away from the village of Walkington. And then to the east, over uh, to the coast, nearer to the coast there, just outside the community of West Newton, there Rathlin have their second well. Now, both of these wells, these exploratory wells, were actually drilled without anybody being aware of what was going on. So these exploratory wells were drilled, the wells were capped, and uh, they took their core samples away for analysis, but now they're back. Now they're back with an intention of running what they call a mini frack. Oh, but hang on a second, they've actually claimed that they're not going to frack at all, but then it's a mini frack. So the bottom line is they're going to frack. They're going to run 15,000 gallons of hydrochloric acid at a 15% solution down into these exploratory wells. Now, I gather that uh, earlier today, um, Rathlin actually had a little bit of uh, an MOF. MOF is the industry phrase for a major operational failure. We've yet to ascertain exactly what occurred, but apparently water was absolutely gushing out of the well, so it looks as though they had an integrity, a well integrity failure uh, somewhere around the aquifer, and water was just pumping out of the surface. Now, I'm waiting for more information on there, but once again, it demonstrates that what we're dealing with is actually cowboys. These are companies that have very, very little experience, in some cases, zero experience, of extraction from unconventional geology. So here is a, a picture taken um, about a couple of weeks ago at the other site, the site out just outside Beverly, where uh, I have now located uh, my, my caravan. And what occurred on Thursday was um, really quite interesting because the bulk of the protection community that is up in Eastern Yorkshire right now, and it's only about a dozen people, but the bulk, about 10, were at the uh, well site um, near Beverly. And four trucks arrived, 
and the intention apparently was to empty the uh, the water tanks beneath the pad. Now that kept the 10 people at Beverly occupied, but meanwhile over at West Norton, uh, West Newton, a convoy had arrived. Now, well, it's about 12 and a half miles away. It takes about half an hour to get there. And unfortunately, there's no phone signal over at the West Newton site. So communication between the two locations isn't perhaps what it, it should be. And unbeknown to the group gathered at uh, Beverly, a convoy of about a dozen trucks was delivering the initial infrastructure to the site at West Newton. There were only two people there. But one of those individuals decided that there was no way that he was going to stand by and simply give the convoy free passage uh, up the road, up the lane to the well site. So he elected to do what has been done at Balkham and at Barton Moss, although generally with greater numbers. And what he elected to do there was to walk in front of the trucks. So consequently, he was on his own. And fortunately, he was live streaming at the time. And although the quality of the video isn't that great, I want you to see what happened as Dom walked the trucks down and then how the Humberside police reacted to his one man protest. Right, so I'm still walking down the road by myself a whole great convoy of people behind me coming here to drill holes in the earth. This is a peaceful protest of which I am not obstructing any law, exercising my right to walk down the public carriageway, which I was told yesterday by a member of East Riding Council that it is. Two police officers coming towards me from the direction of the drill site. Behind me, got some rig workers here. Looks like they work for Marriott Drilling Group. Um, we do have a rig as well, it seems like. Being filmed by these EGs. Very nice. It's not looking like it's just just the water, is it? Fucking outwitted you on that one a little bit. <laughs> you must think I'm stupid. <laughs> just coming to get the water, hey? Yeah. That's a great way to like establish trust between police and the protectors, isn't it? Sir, I believe you're willfully obstructing the highway. I'm not willfully obstructing the highway. I'm not willfully obstructing the highway. I am exercising. I'm that? exercising my right to walk upon you, the public carriageway. The I'm not. I'm walking. Walk I'm not obstructing. I'm walking. I am there. walking down Stop. down the public carriageway. I'm walking down the public carriageway. There is uh, no 
the way you can... You walk faster with us. I'm walking I know you at my own I speed. Know. It's not for you to um, determine at what speed I walk at. It'd just be a bit better because you... I know. Down, that's, that's your like, opinion. I'm exercising my right to protest under the European Convention of Human Rights. If you stop me from doing that in any way, you will be taken to court. You will be prosecuted for that. Like, uh, like I'm walking at like a rate which like, suits me and not obstructing the highway because I am moving. Like, to I'm, the highway. The highway I'm not. I'm, I am using the highway. I'm using the highway to move myself. I'm, no, I, I, like what is that a proper speed? Like who determines that? Is it you? Like, you just keep pace with me. I'm walking. Yeah, I'm walking at a reasonable speed here. It's not even far, you know, like, I know it isn't, like, I'm exercising my right to protest and I ask you to respect that. That's your right. That, that, that as is your duty as a police officer to let enforce my human rights, that is one of my human rights to protest. Like, um, if I walk faster, th th that would be like a detriment to my right to protest. Like, you've already made mistakes. You've already made two mistakes today. Go on, then. I can tell you later what they are. <laughs> I mean, if you're going to be this way straight in, then it's not looking good for later, you know? Like, like you need to build, like, trust between the protectors and the police force. And, like, threatening, yeah, the warning, we'll just threatening to arrest me for walking down a public carriageway it's not a good way to go about it. So I'm not willfully you obstructing the highway. I'm uh, using the highway to move right, myself. Move off the highway, please, I'm, sir. I'm walking on the highway. You have no reason to make me move off the highway. Move off the highway, Why? Please, sir. Why? I'm not doing you anything. Not free to all right, we're allowed to remove you off the highway. You cannot move me off the highway. I'm using the public highway. I'm using the public highway. Just stand over here. Just Can, stand get your hands off me. You're assaulting me. Get off me. Get off me. No, don't so not arrest the highway. Please don't arrest me. Yeah, you're under arrest. Don't arrest me. So we saw there one man, one man. It's evident that the community around West Newton have not seen any of the sort of video footage that I showed earlier from Arkansas or Louisiana and uh, it actually could have been from anywhere where the mother frackers have got their bits in the ground. One man, Dom was a hero. He wasn't going to be intimidated and thankfully he was able to live stream. By the time I and a few others got across to West Newton, obviously Dom had been uh, taken away, the convoy had got into the well site and initially the police tried to prevent us from walking up the lane. Now I have posted the uh, the video that I shot at West Newton um, on YouTube and I don't have time to show it in the show this evening. But basically, as soon as the police realized that we were not going to be intimidated by them and that we expressed our right to walk down the road, they backed off. But uh, then another group of police came down from the well site and effectively we had a Mexican standoff about halfway up the road. Well, unbeknown to the police, I had actually run out of battery in my cameras. And uh, so um, discretion being the better part of valor, uh, we decided just to um, maintain the standoff um, and then walk back to the entrance as the convoy was leaving. The reality is that the Humberside Police have stated that they will apply um, the principle of picketing. So they're effectively treating the protest as a picket and applying the Trade Union Labour Relations Act, when in reality they should of course be uh, applying um, the Human Rights Act of 1998 and certainly taking account of Articles 10 and 11. Well. The Humberside Police have also acknowledged that they will revise their interpretation of events when perhaps the numbers of protectors increase. But at the moment, the protection community in Humberside is 
easily outnumbered by about 10 to 1. So we have a situation here where the first live fracks are about to be conducted in the UK and yet the protection community is extremely thin on the ground. The camps are supported by members of the local community who have done their research and realise the implications and in fact some of those local people come up to the camps specifically to talk to other locals as they stop on their, their drive through. Obviously it has much more impact when it's somebody from the local community talking to another local than it does from somebody who's come from outside. So please, if you're looking for a place to camp for a few days or even just visit for a day, please consider coming up to Humberside and visiting the um, Walkington or the West Newton camps. Now at the moment I'm clocking some three and a half, four thousand miles a month as I move between the studios in Plymouth, um, the front line at uh, Humberside and various events. In fact, at the weekend I was speaking at the Sunrise Festival. And I have to say, I was uh, very pleasantly surprised to have an audience of about 45 on Saturday night, when, in my opinion, there was far more attractive um, entertainment on offer elsewhere on the site. But fortunately, more and more people are starting to realize that this is something that we just cannot afford to have unleashed in this country. Now, over the last couple of weeks, um, we had as guests um, Dan, Dan Schreiber and Mike New from Bentley in Australia, where there were some 2,000 people gathered in northern New South Wales in an attempt to prevent Megasco from starting an exploratory well in the Northern Rivers area. A little far, a little about 150 miles south or so of the area, uh, the southern part of the area shown in the animation during the break uh, in southern Queensland. The good news is that the New South Wales government have realised that the people had not granted social licence. In other words, there was anything but apathy. And the people of New South Wales were not going to allow the mother frackers to decimate their state as they had done in Queensland. So Matt Gasco have had their license withdrawn. And the official reason for the license being withdrawn is that Matt Gasco had failed to conduct the uh, consultation appropriately with the community. So we have a short video of the celebrations at Bentley as the um, decision of the New South Wales government was announced and the camp started to pack up. Look at the difference in the numbers between the people in New South Wales and those at West Newton last week. We won our battle for Bentley. We won our battle for this um, area itself. Um, we do know that it is just a suspension at the moment, but we feel really confident that under community support, Northern Rivers, um, they won't come here. I was up at Gate A and it was a fairly quiet morning that morning. There were only about 30 of us around, maybe more, but about 30 around the fire just as the dawn was coming. It was a bit of a sombre moment. And my phone went off and I was quite embarrassed that I'd forgotten to turn the rotten thing off, so it went jangle, jangle, jangle. And then I flipped it open and saw that it was Ros Irwin, who's a former mayor of Lismore, and she was one of the delegation that went to Sydney. I opened my phone and she said, uh, it's Ros here, so I put her on speakerphone and held up my phone to the meeting. And they stopped and listened and there was just an amazing silence because it just couldn't, it took a while to sink in. I was just getting dressed and, and my neighbour, Jen, said, are you in there? Are you in there? We've won, we've won, we've won. So I cancelled work and came straight here. <laughs> By 10 o'clock, my face was very sore down there from too much smiling and laughing. <laughs> so on Thursday, we were elated with the news, but we also, it's like a roller coaster ride because it was like, oh, they're not coming. Oh. This has been a really hard journey. You all need to take care of each other now because we haven't had that climax. There's a lot of people who are a little bit stressed out, a little bit in shock, and the camp's going to close and everyone's going to go home. Since last Thursday when the wonderful news was had that the licences were suspended, um, we've gone into our bump-out mode. 
So we've had numerous dozens of meetings on how to pull down a site of this size and pull it down um, with the awareness that people are going to find it difficult to let go. It could have been bad that we would be dismantling the camp having lost, which would have been extremely difficult. But it's almost as difficult dismantling the camp having won because many people are very attached to that winning and to the moment of euphoria and to the positivity, the communication with everybody else, the sense of meaning, the sense of purpose, the fact that a lot of our needs were being looked after by many other people around here, toilets, water, food, all sorts of things. So you could see that some people who didn't have a lot else to do were really struggling with the fact that this is over, it's great, we now have to go. Just think for a minute right now of something that you like to do Maybe something you haven't been getting the time to do that you can now begin doing again. A shower. A shower! <laughs> On Monday, we thought the cops were going to pull it all out. On Monday, we started pulling it all out. It seemed a little bit sad, actually. We well, missed out on seeing the big crowd that was going to come. I missed out on seeing how much trouble the cops were going to have with our facilities, and that was going to be extremely interesting. <laughs> we were here about seven weeks into the protectors' camp being built, so it started with a couple of cars, and then it built from there. And out of that, we built ourselves a little uh, village. See, they're all waving. Yeah. Look, even up on the top, look, he's waving. Great the players. musicians down here. That was way back at the beginning, look. Right? Just starting off. I've been out here for about five weeks, six weeks. I came up from, um, from Adelaide to live on my own in Danoon. And uh, my daughter said, hey, you ought to go out to Bentley. It was full with um, cushions in it so you can lay down properly. But there'd be one person here, like that. And the other person would be done the same thing, and the way they get the toilet, they'd go upside down or something like that. Pretty much a lock on place. And they have to dig you out to stop the. Because um, every hour it costs them, the companies a million dollars. It slows them down, and eventually, if they get, if they get through, we, we block every truck and all that. On the ground, it's just been hundreds and hundreds of people taking over their particular niche and their particular piece of expertise, which is you know, an extraordinary thing for me to see. Because we've had certain, certain key people that have been doing certain aspects, but when the blockade got going, we just had people coming to the place, hanging around for a bit, seeing what they could do, and then they just pitched in and did it. It was just the most miraculous thing. We come from all different backgrounds here. There are people that, that wouldn't normally relate to me and I wouldn't normally relate to them, but we meet at the point of uh, clean water and fresh air. Shane will collect the hand on Wednesday, it says here. Oh, good. Well, it's Thursday. Yeah, I think he possibly we'll means Wednesday him. next week. Ah. Uh, we'll, well, I reckon it should be turned around the other way and just go up you, Matasco. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> the owner, Mr Scarabalotti, has been completely clear from the beginning that he wanted us here for as long as it took, but then we had to go. No, there's no doubt about it. So we have to do that. And we have to honour him because we're very, very thankful for what he did. And we're now flat out making sure that we get every skerrick off this place. Because I'm well aware that he has cattle on here and even tiny skerricks of metal or plastic can go into their gut and injure them, even kill them. It's, it's the, uh, the end of an era but a beginning of a new one. I think a lot of us are going from here with a sense that we need to uh, take the battle further. We need to encourage other uh, communities who are uh, fighting similar battles and we also need to um, get the message through to these politicians. So this is a place where we can come and we can set ourselves back up again on the camp. So um, this is probably a message to any mining companies that want to come into the Northern Rivers, let alone anywhere in New South Wales. We're prepared, we're ready, we can unpack very quickly. A little bit of deflation but overall great amount of joy and happiness because we made history here.
Isn't that absolutely awesome? You know, when I was speaking at the Sunrise Festival on Sunday, or Saturday evening, I made the observation that if everybody who was at the festival at the weekend, which was probably some two and a half, three thousand people at, at least, if they could all make their way up to the East Riding of Yorkshire, then we could shut this abomination down in a heartbeat. That was a serious blockade. The people of Bentley were determined that Magasco were not going to get their bits in the ground in any way, shape or form. Compare that to the one man uh, protest of Dom last week. We have a long, long, long way to go. But with we need to wake up to the magnitude of this, and um, only uh, today, um, Andrew Austin, the Chief Executive Officer of IGAS, here he is, uh, has announced that uh, they're going to seek planning permission to sink two more exploratory wells um, either side the Pennines. Now, what is outrageous here, of course, is that IGAS is effectively buoyed buy money from two French corporations, Gaz de France and Total. The irony here, of course, is that France has banned and outlawed hydraulic fracturing, a decision upheld by the Council Constitutionnel in October of last year. But there is some hope. Here we have uh, um, the statement from the, the Lords that uh, the Economic Affairs Committee basically said that uh, it's going to create 100,000 jobs and we need to get fracking. But um, Francis Egan has uh, stated that unless, unless the legislation is introduced to permit the mother frackers to drill under people's properties, the industry is unlikely to go ahead. So here is Francis Egan maybe giving us a clue of where we should put some really serious focus. So get on the phone, make sure that your MP, whomever that may be, whichever party they represent, make sure they know that this is a piece of legislation that it is not acceptable to the British public. And if they support this change in the law, then they are unlikely to be re-elected. But politicians, of course, are always pretty slimy and they're already starting to create ways in which they can um, convince their electors that you know, they're not going to be supporting this agenda, at least not until after the next election. This is why this next period, this 340 days, is so significant. It's a report that was actually uh, released shortly after the uh, last council elections and the observation being that the oil and gas in the south of the country, in the Weald, may actually simply be a myth. And what is there may be extremely difficult to recover. So not worth pursuing. Well, this is, of course, a way in which the Tory MPs are trying to convince their electorate in the south, in the Tory heartland, you have nothing to worry about because there's no real oil and gas in the area. So yeah, they might come and drill an exploratory well, but they're not going to frack. So they're just going to focus on the desolate northeast and the desolate northwest. Well, hopefully that's not going to um, to wash with too many people. And um, today in the Times, there was the announcement. We go that uh, Paul McCartney has apparently thrown his weight into the call for not only a halt to fracking, but a debate on the whole issue of fracking. Well, elsewhere in the Times was an interesting article because here it said the frackers say that the public must be persuaded. So supposedly here is the industry actually suggesting to the British government that you know they don't really want all this forced legislation. You know, bear in mind that the British government, of course has already stated that communities will get £100,000 if they don't resist the industry coming into their community. It'll get 100% of the business rates. And now, 
it's floating the idea that they could get £800,000. But of course, what they're not telling the communities is, is that that 800000 is made up of £20,000 per well. So the observation being is that if a community invites the mother frackers in, then they may be subjected to up to 40 wells, benefiting them, <laughs> I use the term loosely, to the tune of £800,000. But bear in mind, of course, that that entire community will be living within one mile of a fracked well and all the risks that are associated with that. Now, I said earlier that I'm doing about three and a half thousand, four thousand miles a month and um, much of that is, is still trying to spread the word and like I said, you know, we've got 343 days, it's actually less now, that's from last week, to save the UK. This is actually a headline from the uh, Sharing Caring Sun, not but this is uh, looking at the um, way in which people voted in the recent Euro elections. And you see here that the Lib Dems are effectively a lost cause. Tories and the Labour around equal, 24, 25%. And of course, the not great surprise, UKIP topping out at 27%. Now, whilst no one is necessarily expecting that they repeat this performance, at the forthcoming general election, what cannot be ignored is the fact that a significant percentage of the population are somewhat disenchanted, to say the least, with the traditional parties. Now, whilst I'm not going to suggest that UKIP is really going to be ultimately any different, it is interesting to note that uh, nobody from UKIP was invited to the um, Bilderberger meeting in uh, Denmark. That uh, actually should speak uh, perhaps some volumes. But some 4.3 million people voted UKIP. If we look at the, go down the list there, the green vote was a credible 1.245, 1.245 million, nearly uh, one and a quarter million people voted green. Now, I think it's pretty safe to assume that everybody who has uh, environmental concerns, everybody who would consider themselves to be green or to be an environmentalist is already on board regarding the fight against fracking. The real target has to be the 12 million people who voted UKIP, Labour and Conservative. And right now, one thing I know for sure is that there is a significant groundswell amongst the grassroots of UKIP to try to persuade the leadership to adopt an anti-fracking stance. Now, whilst this may not sit very easy with the Greens or those who sit anywhere to the left of centre, in terms of political strategy, this could be exactly what is needed to bring the other parties into an anti-fracking stance. And that would then perhaps change the whole situation. So the challenge is not to be preaching to the converted, not to be preaching or even talking necessarily with the Greens or with the traditional environmental groups, but reaching out to those who are traditional members of Labour, Conservative, or the new thrust towards UKIP. So, one of the things that uh, I'm going to be continuing to do is uh, as many public events as I possibly can. And uh, this coming weekend, in fact, tomorrow, I'm going to be heading back up to East Yorkshire. And then at the weekend, I'm going to be down in uh, East Sussex. And the group that's organising the event on Saturday is the Wielden Against Fracking Group. Fortunately, they are not deceived by the uh, British Geological Survey report that there may not be much gas there. That could be, of course, a red herring. Um, and as you can see that uh, there's a number of speakers there including uh, Dr. Jennifer Huggett, who's a geologist, and Sue Taylor, the remarkable Sue Taylor, uh, the founder of cons the website Conservatives Against Fracking, and one of the prime movers in the uh, Borkham campaign. Now, there's actually a second group in the area who um, decided that uh, uh, I probably wouldn't have long enough to speak at that, that meeting, so they've arranged for me to speak the following day in um, a, uh, a venue very close to the one on Saturday. And um, here, uh, it's going to be a full sort of hour and a half presentation, half an hour of questions, no sacred cows, throw anything into the equation that you, you want. And uh, so hopefully between the two events, we can ensure that the 
East Sussex community uh, adopt a totally anti-fracking stance and hopefully develop a strategy to uh, convince their MPs accordingly. So the event on the Saturday um, is at the in Saturday afternoon is at the Union Church on the High Street in Heathfield, and on Sunday it's at the Goward Hall in Cade Street in Heathfield. After those uh, events, I shall be heading back down to Plymouth for uh, next week's shows and then most probably back up again to East Yorkshire. Now, it's the end of the show and uh, for those of you, the hardcore that have listened all the way through, um, most of you, if not all of you, have probably already donated towards the fracking awareness campaign. And I'm only able to continue doing what I'm doing with your support. So if you feel that you are able to make a further contribution or to contribute perhaps for the first time, please go to frackingnightmare.com and click on the uh, buttons on the left hand side of the page there. Any donation, however small, is gratefully received and it all goes towards raising awareness and shutting down this abomination. So I'm going to leave you this evening on a bit of a light-hearted note. Obviously, um, the protection community has had its run-in with the Greater Manchester Police over the last six months. And Officer 666 is becoming quite a celebrity in Greater Manchester. But uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, he was in Greater Manchester and he came across a, a young police sergeant who had clearly had the operation. He would had his sense of humour removed. So Officer 666 was arrested for impersonating a police officer. So enjoy, and I'll see you next week, or hopefully before, in East Yorkshire. Thanks a lot. Bye now. You not protesting. You seem to have got some type of banner here. Yeah, you seem to have got some type of banner here. Why are you asking me about the banner? I don't have a banner. Is that your banner? Yes, Can I ask you what it says on there, please? Well, it's only order and fold. Do you know him? Are you aware of police you know corruption? Him? Yeah, I know the face. Yeah, yeah, obviously. Um, am I aware of police corruption? Yes. I'm aware of the term police corruption. Are you yeah. acting on your oath of office today? Uh, I am. I'm here as a constable. What are you here as? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a member of the public, clearly. It seems to me like you're trying to impersonate yourself as a police officer. No really, no really. Well you've got a uh, police hat on that says police officer. No it, it does not. No it does not. It does, it says police officer. No it does not. Can you focus in on that for No, me? you see there are quite a few people who confirmed that he's not impersonating and uh, this Can you just uh, focus in on the fact that that says police no, officer? No I can't see it. Says GMP. I can't see it. So you're not willing to put your camera on that? Why I should do that? I mean, you're filming it. So well, you're, you're, trying, you're, just, you're just trying to stitch a person up. Well, what for? I'm not trying to stitch a person up. What are you doing then? I'm just trying to ask him what, uh, what's going on here. Well, we've just explained it to you. Got, uh, we've just explained it to you. Constable I, don't, six, I don't want to be assaulted. Do not uh, Please, do not okay, assault person. Assault. Yeah, you have. I you have. Something else. Yeah, you have. No, you have. I haven't. That was an assault. Going too close. I haven't assaulted you at all. Sergeant. Uh, okay, I'm assaulting you. I'm arresting you on, on suspicion of impersonating a police officer. You do not say anything, but it may have. Anything you do say may be given in evidence. Uh, take, take do you understand that? Take my camera. Do you understand that? Yeah. Can I ask you to uh, drop that for me, please? Drop it. Excuse me. Take my camera. I'll keep on to them if that's alright. I'll do take that for me. It's PCSO. So, what is he arrested for? Impersonation of police officer. Impersonation of police officer? Yeah. It's quite interesting. This PC.